This Tronxy X5 SA Pro is a large format feature packed Core XY 3D printer and it's got some problems. I've had this printer for some time now. In fact, I got it around the same time as I got the Seket SK Go, another large format Core XY 3D printer, and I've made around five videos on that now. I'm happy to start this video by publicly apologizing to Tronxy for taking so long with this review, but as you'll see, there were some issues that definitely held me back. A while ago, I saw a video from Joe, the 3D maker noob, defending himself over an unbiased review of the X5S which is the predecessor to this machine. Like him, I review printers as sent to me and I try not to fix the problems I find with them along the way. It's the only way that you, the viewer, can know what to expect if they purchase a machine that I featured in a video. If you're interested in reading the review policy that manufacturers have to agree to before they send me a machine like this, it's linked below in the description. But with this key principle in mind, let's continue with our review. Here are the details from the website for the Tronxy X5 SA Pro. As you can see, it's large format with 330 by 330 by 400 tall build volume. It is a Core XY machine and it has some other nice features such as auto bed leveling, a Titan clone extruder, high precision guide rails, filament runout detection, power outage protection, and a three and a half inch color touchscreen. It also boasts an ARM 32 bit mainboard. Print quality is something that's really promoted here with some real shots of prints off the machine. I was provided with my review model for free so I'm not sure on the price based off their website and I'm still confused when I look at the most popular websites. On Banggood it's going for 430, AliExpress 420, Gearbest 530, Alibaba only 315 delivered to the US and on Amazon 480 plus shipping. The first thing you should know about this 3D printer is that it's definitely a kit. Expect to spend a whole day putting it together. As you can see on the table, there are a lot of components and experience with 3D printers would definitely be an advantage here and therefore I wouldn't recommend it for beginners. The paper instructions are okay. They are in black and white, but there is a color version of them on the SD card, which I recommend. Also on the SD card is Tronxy Slicer, more on that later on a folder full of STLs for all of the parts on the machine, the USB driver, and some pre-sliced G-code ready to print. Before I could print, however, I needed to tension the belt system and this step gave me a lot of trouble. For comparison, on the SK Go, the motion system is kept square because it's impossible to assemble it in any other way. This Tronxy machine, however, uses T-nuts and with that comes a lot of play. This translates to a gantry that's potentially way out of square before you tension the belts. Which means when I did tension the belts, unless it was perfect, it would pull itself out of square. The instructions for the belt system simply mentioned the tension being equal, but gave no instructions on how to achieve this. Belt tension is a crucial aspect of a Core XY machine, so I contacted Tronxy and asked them to instruct me on their preferred method for tensioning the belts. They sent me this video, which was a really helpful gesture, but all it showed was the path of the belts before they were hooked onto the carriage. The thing about this that didn't help me is that the belts were already cut to the exact length required. I did try to use the sliding motor mounts to tension the belts a little bit better, but this sub-assembly is pretty sloppy and relies on the two belts being cut to a very exact size before you get to this step. In the end, I had to cut my tweaking short because some of the bolt heads were starting to get damaged, therefore leaving me with a machine that wasn't quite square. So I was off to a bad start with the belt tensioning system, but when I was looking up Joe's video to link to in this video, I came across a review from Chris's basement. The acrylic motor mount snapped and almost beheaded him as he tensioned it, so I reckon I probably got off lightly. Unfortunately though, it was a series of bad design decisions on this printer that diminished my experience. Let's get on with looking at the test prints. The first thing I printed was this block off the SD card, but there was a mishap with that because I didn't set the Z offset after leveling and it left a huge scrape in the print bed. 
I'm happy to take the blame for that one, but on other 3D printers, if you haven't set the Z offset, the nozzle is normally safely high above the bed, and then you move it down to find the perfect first layer. Next up, I sliced in Tronxy Slicer, the simple 20 millimeter calibration cube. There's not much to discuss here. It's of average quality, and you can see some marks on the side where with this translucent filament, you can see the infill through the perimeters. I followed the cube up with a 3D Benchy. This one, again, I would describe as average. Remember that I'm using all of the presets from the slicer that they included. And as you can see, this one suffers from quite excessive stringing. It's not perfect, but there's nothing majorly bad either. Apart from once again, seeing the infill on the outside of the perimeters. My first real world print, and it was this electronics enclosure that you'll be seeing in an upcoming modification video. The quality of this one is also what I would describe as average. It's got a lot of horizontal banding up the Z axis, and again, it suffers from a lot of stringing. Probably most concerning, and thanks to my issues with tensioning the belt system, these parts are nowhere near square. When you hold up a tri-square against them, the problem is glaringly obvious. Next up, I thought I'd try a pretty model with this two-headed ogre. Again, we've got bad stringing, but all of the small details of the model probably help to hide a lot of the deficiencies. You can also see on the really small areas, the part cooling is not really up to scratch because it struggled to do it without leaving big blobs. Again, we can see some horizontal banding on the vertical surfaces. Next up was this low poly skull in vase mode, and from a distance, it looks quite spectacular. Up close, however, not so good. There's frequent patterns of surface artifacts all over this print. In this case, I'm not sure if it's related to belt tension or whether it's the more common zebra stripes that you get on older stepper motor drivers. On one side, it's also got this really prominent pattern that looks like it should be from where each new layer starts. But remember this one was done in vase mode, so it's one continuous extrusion. I thought I'd test the part cooling a little bit further as well as the tolerances with this pyramid test. I recently tested this same file on two Ender 3s and they both did a great job in printing it with the two halves coming apart cleanly. This printer, however, did not cope well with the overhangs. There's lots of hanging stringy artifacts, some of which I was able to break apart, but in other parts, the top of the pyramid actually failed, snapping before the two halves would come apart cleanly. On the inside, we can see exactly where the problem was. Next, I tested some different filaments, starting with PETG. These clips are designed to hold bags to their leashes when you're walking your dogs, and this is possibly the cleanest print I did on this printer. The PETG stuck nicely to the bed, and I can't really see any significant problems on this model. I loaded up some ABS and printed this 18 animal puzzle. Again, all of the parts stuck well to the bed, and each of the animal pieces separates as you would hope. There was no problems with the red under tray that holds all of the puzzle pieces either. Next up, some flexibles, and I chose TPU to do this fidget toy. This one was printed at 60 millimeters per second. The extrusion system handled the TPU pretty well at this speed, with the downside being some excessive stringing. After spending a few minutes to clip off most of it, I was able to assemble it and it does work as it's meant to, with the added bonus of being fairly unbreakable with the flex. Finally, I repeated my cube tests, but this time with the aim of testing filament runout detection. I'm pleased to say this went off without a hitch. I had a message on the LCD, changed the filament, and it resumed from the correct position, with the transition being pretty seamless. After another 5-10 minutes, I pulled the plug, once again, I got an appropriate message on the LCD, and when I hit yes, the print continued where it left off. Again, this is pretty seamless, apart from the blob that oozes out when the power is cut. Overall, I'd describe these print tests as average quality, and no doubt proper belt tension would have helped. I did mention at the start that I had a lot of issues, so let's work our way through them. First and foremost, that belt system. I'm not the only one to have problems, and it really limits the printer. Next, this thing is enormous, and that's not necessarily a problem by itself, but it does bring other implications, such as the extruder and spool of filament being mounted on the back. From the front of the machine, you simply can't reach it, which means you need to have it off a wall, or every time you want to change filament, pick up the machine and rotate it. Furthermore, the extruder is very difficult to load. I found that every time I tried to line up the filament, it would continually jam both on the filament runout sensor as well as the actual extruder entry. This isn't helped by the fact the filament runout sensor is mounted on these little spaces and is purposely misaligned from the extruder entry. While reviewing this machine, I really dreaded changing the filament and the problem became even worse when I tried to load up the TPU. 
The next problem is just silly and that's that the Bowdoin PTFE tube is far too long. As well as adding to the woes of retraction, it dangles down, rubs on the belts and even worse, dangles down around the parts. While we're in that area, the cable chain also hangs down too low and rubs on the top side of the belts. Now the bed on this printer is warped, doming on the top like a hill. This is not really uncommon for 3D printers, but on this printer, there's flow on effects. Firstly, the auto bed leveling system doesn't work very well. When you're setting the Z offset in Marlin, you do it live during the print. And for most users, that makes it pretty easy because you can see exactly what's happening and tune it in really nicely. On this printer, however, you have to do it before the print by going to Z offset on the LCD and then using a piece of paper between the nozzle and the bed. You save this value and then you start the print, but there's no baby stepping option from there, which means if something's slightly off, you've got to stop the print and do the whole process again. Now the actual automatic bed leveling doesn't really work. To prove this, I set up a print test with 20 millimeter cubes stopped after only one layer spread around the bed. In the start G code, I had a G29 to probe, but as you can see, the final results were very inconsistent. As we look around, we can see that some are squished down too low with the plastic oozing around the nozzle and creating these little ridges. But in other areas, the nozzle's too far away and we have gaps in between our extrusions. And this is exactly the problem that auto bed leveling is meant to fix. Next up, our rail system have these eccentric adjustment bolts, but there's no tool that comes with the printer to fit in there and to be able to make any adjustments. Despite some features that should help, overall this printer is not very refined and that's mostly down to how loud it is. There's three fans that will be on during printing, and from the menu, we can turn them on one by one to see their effect on the noise level. Next up, the including slicing software, which is a selling point on the website for this printer. Tronxy Slicer is a very limited rebrand of Cura using an older version and it's missing features such as VARS mode. Perhaps the worst thing is they went to all this trouble to rebrand, but the user still has to manually import the profile and that's greatly going to increase the chance of something being missed and causing errors down the line. The firmware on this printer is a complete mystery. When I connect in Pronterface, it tells me I'm online. If I send an M503 to retrieve settings, it doesn't return anything. And if I issue an M115 to report the firmware capabilities, it gives a very cryptic message. And while we're on firmware, there is no thermal runaway protection enabled. I tested heating up with the heater disconnected and also removing the heater wire once the nozzle was up to temperature. In both conditions, no error triggered. I have no idea how this is still occurring in 2020. The LCD screen in some places is also quite counterintuitive. Some parts like manually moving around the print head are okay, but if you go to preheat, the layout's a bit strange having the heated bed first, and when you raise and lower the steps, it goes in values of three degrees. The filament load and unload screen is not labeled well at all, so you need to do some trial and error before you understand what you're actually doing. I noticed while I was using this printer that it appears to have no PID tuning done on the hot end. Therefore, the temperatures fluctuate wildly, five degrees either side of the target during your print. At one point, while printing PETG, the temperatures dropped enough that it caused a hot end clog. Next, our problem is that we need one of these, a scraper. Now this bed did do a good job in adhering to a range of different filaments, but we're forced to hack our prints off. Specifically, this is a problem for this printer because it uses two untethered stepper motors on each side for the bed. So if you're rough while getting your prints off, you risk moving them out of alignment and causing print problems later on. For comparison, on the second SK Go, it uses a single stepper motor and then a belt system to keep the two sides aligned. Finally, around the machine, the cable management is poor. The instructions stopped before telling us how they wanted us to cable tie up the cables. Therefore, we're left with all these long dangling strands, which in my opinion is quite untidy. I think that's most of it. I might have missed some things, but as you can see, this machine has a fair amount of problems. It seems to me like it's been designed by someone who doesn't really do much 3D printing and hasn't had much hands-on experience with a machine like this. A couple of years ago, I reviewed the Tronxy X1 and there was some shortcuts and cost cutting, but I could forgive it because that was only a $120 printer. 
this, whatever the final price is, is worth a lot more and I find it a lot harder to forgive. I think overall my experience could be summed up by one part of the product page. We can see here they're making a big claim, but they haven't quite put in enough attention to detail and they're left with an unfortunate issue that takes the shine off. Now remember, I have to review machines while they're stock and I acknowledge that a lot of this could be fixed with mods. Some things like shortening the PTFE tube are going to be really simple. Other things, however, are going to require a lot more time and effort. I'm quite confident that with a big overhaul, this could actually end up being quite an excellent printer. I definitely would not recommend it for beginners, however, it's only for someone really experienced who knows what they're doing and when they get this machine, knows exactly what they're in for. If you do have some experience with this machine, I'd love to read about it down below in the comments section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.